My name is uh, Skand Shekhar. I'm an endocrinologist, board certified, and I'm also a principal investigator at the NIH. And the areas of, of investigation and research for me include disorders of reproduction and disorders that affect the central nervous system, also known as neuroendocrinology. Um, and within that, uh, I also do a lot of research, and we've done research previously on a disease called Erdheim Chester disease. So Erdheim Chester disease is a rare disease, um, as as many of your audience members may not have heard about it. It was first described in the early uh, to mid 19th century uh, when Dr. Erdheim and Chester actually uh, gave a description about it. And at that time, it was known to be a blood disorder, and it over a period of time, our understanding of this disease grew. And it became evident that this is a disorder that is fairly sy systemic, meaning it affects different parts of the body. Um, what we know as of 2024 is that this is a type of blood cancer actually now. It was reclassified by the World Health Organization as a blood cancer uh, to try to encompass and capture the, the degree of debilitation that it causes. In terms of who it can affect, unfortunately it can affect anybody. Uh, there is no data we have in terms of what the risk factors are. It's uh, related to a, a mutation in, in one of the blood cells that causes this. Um, in terms of the disease itself, it affects a lineage of blood cells. And the most common mutation that leads to this disorder is called a BRAF V600 mutation. Um, and that mutation leads to what is known as clonal proliferation, which means that a lot of these cells multiply and they occupy different parts of the body. So as a result of this cancerous-like state, uh, there are different signs and symptoms that can um, present as a manifestation of Erdheim Chester disease. Most commonly, uh, patients who have this rare disease, they tend to have bone pain. Um, which is called ostalgia in, in technical terms, but what it means is that any of the long bones in the body can have pain and specifically pronounced at night time. Other symptoms that usually go hand in hand include central nervous system involvement, so there can be gray matter changes on, on imaging, there can be uh, de a decline in cognitive capacity, there can be loss of balance known as ataxia, and there can also be involvement of the endocrine secretion rising from the brain and the hypothalamus to the pituitary. And there is a endocrine condition called diabetes insipidus, uh, which is a deficiency of a hormone called arginine vasopressin. And that is the most common manifestation of Erdheim Chester disease. And in many cases, that is the first presenting feature of this disease. Um, in a, no, a number of these patients. Unfortunately, the diagnosis of these patients is significantly delayed, which is in part because this disorder is not detected and managed appropriately. And it's only after years of having some of these symptoms that they ultimately reach a diagnosis. In terms of how the diagnosis is established, the best way of establishing the diagnosis is using a biopsy where you stick in a needle in the involved area and then you take a piece of that tissue out and then you examine it under a microscope. And based on certain characteristic features, you're able to make the diagnosis. The good news is that there is genetic testing available, so that has made this diagnostic process a lot simpler and many of our patients can get a diagnosis where previously it used to be harder to, to, to reach a diagnosis. Now, we're in a space where that diagnosis can be achieved with a certain degree of accuracy, provided you're at the right center and your, your care is in the right expert's hands. So that's as far as the clinical and burden of disease is concerned. In terms of management, I think the first thing that, again, 
is the most important is recognition of these signs and symptoms. So it's very important that those who are practicing in the community, especially endocrinologists and other subspecialists, um, specialists like neurologists and hematologists, oncologists, they they suspect the disease and they rule out other diseases that may have similar features. And once they suspect the disease, then they are able to get a biopsy, make sure that the biopsy is reviewed by experts in the field, they undergo genetic testing. And in addition, there are a number of different tests that have to be performed when you, such a patient is first diagnosed. So for example, a brain MRI is, is recommended uh, because there can be brain involvement as we talked about earlier, but there is also a significant burden of cardiovascular disease, there can be bone involvement. So many other tests that are recommended uh, and these patients are best treated at a center that knows what they are doing. So there are ECD specialized centers that have been set up across the country and in fact across the world. In terms of treatment for the disease itself, the good news is that uh, after many years of not having any specific treatment options, in the last half a decade or so there has been significant progress because we've had approvals of what is known as a BRAF V600 inhibitor. So I earlier mentioned that this mutation is found in a majority of patients who have Wardheim Chester disease. So targeted therapy against this mutation is now FDA approved and available and is being prescribed. And treatment with that type of therapy, uh, which is a BRAF V600 inhibitor, uh, can significantly alleviate some of the signs and symptoms and improve the quality of life and uh, improve the longevity of these patients where previously they had no good options. Now we have a few of them. So that's as far as treating the disease itself is concerned. Unfortunately, many of the endocrine problems that arise out of this disorder and even many others that are non-endocrine tend to be irreversible. What that implies is that due to the destruction of the normal tissue by these abnormal cancerous cells, function is lost. And so, depending on what the nature of that function lost is, the treatment will be primarily a replacement of that type of tissue or the function that it performs. For example, if somebody develops uh, diabetes insipidus, which is one of the most common endocrine problems, uh, the treatment is to give them arginine vasopressin, which is the hormone that is deficient in these patients. And that can be given orally, it can give, be given intranasally, there are even subcutaneous formulations that can be given. The other disorders that we have published on and we've shown a very high incidence of are thyroid abnormalities. So many of these patients have low thyroid levels, so the treatment involves replacing thyroid hormone with a pill. Uh, men who have this disease, they tend to develop hypogonadism. Um, hypogonadism is a deficiency of the male sex hormone, testosterone. May or may not be accompanied with infertility. So to treat these patients, we primarily replace them with testosterone therapy. And similarly, there may be other cardiometabolic complications. So they may have diabetes or they may have abnormalities in their cholesterol. And depending on what those abnormalities are, you could treat them based on the specific type of abnormality. You could give uh, treatment for diabetes, you can give treatment for reducing their cholesterol and correcting some of the other cardiometabolic complications. So those are sort of the general principles of treating, but I think the most important element is being referred to a, a center that really knows what it, it is doing, has the expertise in-house, and has a, a variety of consultants neurologists, endocrinologists, hematologists, pathologists uh, who are able to contribute uh, to man managing these patients. We've published a number of studies and we've, we've been presenting throughout the course of the various endocrine society meetings. Um, the most recent work that we've been working on which was presented at the endocrine society meeting last year and which is currently um, in the process of being published as a full-length paper uh, focuses on the disease that I talked about earlier called diabetes insipidus. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, it is one of the diseases that has, uh, that is one of the most frequent diseases, uh, endocrine disease disorders that are seen as part of this disease, or Chester disease. 
And what we found very briefly, if I can summarize, we found that that tends to be a linkage with the BRAF B600 mutation, meaning those patients who have the BRAF B600 mutation tend to have a higher risk of developing diabetes insipidus compared to those who do not have BRAF B600 mutations. That's the first thing. The second thing is because this is a male dominant disease, we did see that males tended to be slightly more affected, but again, the data is not fully clear on that, and so we cannot conclusively affirm that it is more common in men. And we also found that in many of those patients, uh, diabetes insipidus was one of the earliest presenting features of this disease. So if endocrinologists are seeing somebody who do not have a clear explanation for diabetes insipidus, then erdheim chester disease should be considered along with other causes of diabetes insipidus. Um, more information is going to be presented, but the other important element which is important for clinicians and scientists is that in many of these patients there were early onset findings on brain MRIs and pituitary MRIs and there was a loss of what is called the posterior pituitary bright spot, meaning there was a little bit of a correlation between imaging and the disease itself. So there was some degree of correlation but further studies are needed to be able to fully define the nature and scope of, uh, of diabetes insipidus. Some of the previous work that has also been presented at ENDO um, and has now actually been published has been the high burden of abnormal pituitary imaging and abno abnormal pituitary function in these patients. So those who do have pituitary imaging abnormalities, they tend to have a larger burden of hypothyroidism, of hypogonadism, of diabetes insipidus, and many other endocrine abnormalities which need to be thoroughly screened. Another initial study that we had performed in this um, disease, which was previously um, published and, and presented at Endocrine Society, was relating to the high burden of thyroid abnormalities, where we showed that there was a significant risk of excess thyroid dysfunction in patients with Erdheim Chester disease. So, I think it, uh, to summarize the research that has been so far presented is that there's a high burden of a number of different types of endocrine disorders. Many of them are related to the pituitary gland. And in many cases, unfortunately, that damage can be permanent. And so therefore, even after the successful treatment of Erdheim Chester, many of these patients require lifelong therapy with um, hormones and, and any other you know, treatments that may, they, that may be needed along the course. So that's sort of the summary of the, of the research we've done so far. Message to particularly endocrinologists in the community, uh, when they do not have a clean explanation of what is going on, uh, my strong suggestion and plea to them would be to refer these patients to a specialized center so that they can get a thorough assessment and they can get a comprehensive evaluation by a multidisciplinary team. Early referrals and early detection alongside appropriate early management can really change the course of how these patients do over the long term and even over the short term. So if you do see something as they say, say something and refer this patient out to a specialized center and reach out for help with patients, with, uh, to, to, to physicians who have experience with treating some of these disorders. That would be the main takeaway and, and try to do the best you can uh, to help these patients out.